So hello and good evening. I'm Marlene Speth and on behalf of the organizing committee and the ERS, um, we are very happy to welcome you to the ERS webinar series with a great team of panelists. So tonight I will be moderating the webinar together with Pavel Surda from London. And we would like to thank Olympus as the main sponsor. This evening, as you can maybe already see, is a little bit special because we would like to introduce you to the first holiday edition and present interesting rhinology cases. So it is a real pleasure to me to welcome six great colleagues and friends from all over Europe to share this session just before Christmas. So we have Hesham Saleh from England. We got Gwide Adriensen from the Netherlands. We have Professor Serkan Gode from Turkey and Anna O'Sullivan from Austria, Puya Degani from Italy, and Sebastian Rush also from Austria. In this webinar tonight, we would encourage you to type any kinds of questions into the chat or into the Q&A function. And now to kick the webinar off, we would like to start with Puya. Puya is uh, working in Italy in the city of Perugia, which is the city which is also known for your chocolate, if you look it up, <laughs> one of the most famous chocolate events. And also regarding Puglia, Puglia is not only trained in Italy, but has done various fellowships and observerships in New York, London, Iran, and Italy. He lost his sense of smell and taste at the beginning of the pandemic and was one of the first ones to note and publish about it. He has also founded the Associazione Naso Sano in Italy, and he is also involved in humanitarian ENT projects. I would now like to pass on to Puya. Morning, everyone. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Pavel, for uh, letting me <clears throat> share my screen, and thank you for the invitation. So today's we are going to discuss some. Uh, um, interesting cases. And I really think that we will probably have uh, lots of fun during this. So this is recently what we have. This is, uh, this case is uh, regardless, regarding proboscis lateralis. So in this specific case, we are going to discuss the coexistence of proboscis lateralis and multiple craniofacial neurological cardiac spinal deformities. So it's for us, for me, it was a one of a kind case. So I would like to declare no conflict of interest. But what is uh, the case? There was a five day old full term baby delivered by a cesarean section, which cried immediately at birth. And this is important somehow, we will go through that after, with no significant antenatal history of birth defects, regardless the parents and the um, in regard to viruses during the antenatal history. What we have saw uh, during the examination, we saw this trunk-like appendage that was noted arising from the superomedial canthus of the left eye, uh, the dimension of which was a 26 millimeter for 12 millimeter in size with a small discharging tract. The left nasal cavity was hypoplastic with the left anophthalmia. No cleft palate, cleft lip, or coronal atresia was noted. As you can see here, the left anophthalmia and hypoplasia of the left nasal cavity. So the patients, the small baby went, some images, magnetic resonance imaging shown colpocephaly, which is actually the increase in dimension of the ventricles. The CT scan imaging of the face revealed minor bony defects of the left nasal bone, the frontal process of the maxilla and an absent na nasal turbinates and absence of maxillary and ethmoid sinuses. Pretty hypoplastic, this one. 
the echocardiography 2D echo revealed the presence of a large ventricular septal defect, a small patent ductus arterius, and two ostium secundum atrial septal defects. The CT of the thorax and abdomen show a T10 hemivertebra that cause a focal scoliosis and with right-sided convexity. When we were asking the, the parents of uh, regardless the treatment, uh, everything else, the parents deferred treatment until the child grows up. We will go through that because that's important. What we do have by now are very, very few possibilities uh, for treatment in such patients. So what is proboscis lateralis? Proboscis lateralis is a rare congenital facial anomaly, usually due to incomplete formation of the nose in utero, and it happens one in 100,000 birds, and is characterized by a primitive tubular structure protruding from the facial surface, often from the medial canthus of the eye. It was first described by Foster in 1861 and may cause major psychosocial issue due to its aesthetic disagreeability. But not only this, there are few, very, very few <clears throat> um, scale or classification, one of which was described by Bu Chai in a 14 year follow up for a proboscis la la lateralis, which suggested the following classification. The group one, is uh, consisted by a patient with a normal nose, which is least common. The group two with an ipsilateral nasal deformity, which is second in frequency. The group three with ipsilateral nasal deformity plus deformity in the eye and the ocular adnexa, which is the most common type for the Buchai classification. The group four consisted with ipsilateral nasal deformity plus deformity of the eye and or ocular adnexa and cleft lip or palate. He also described and reported that the greater incidence are among females. But in 2012, the new classification from Sakamoto was de developed based on a review of 50 cases. He basically changed the classification and he described different aspects of it. The first group was consisted in a and the presence of this uh, structure in the left side of the face with normal eyes and anexa and no problems regardless of the cleft lip. The group two had some normal interorbital distance, but <clears throat> the defect consisted in the left portion. The group three was consisted also, and regardless, uh, the eyes have an, an abnormal anexa with no involvement of the cleft lip. The group four in this specific case consisting in hypertellurism, the nose defects, which is uh, regarding both uh, one side specifically and complication with the cleft palate. Group five was uh, consisted with hypertellurism with encephalocele, defect of the nose, most of the time bilateral defect, abnormal eyes and agnexa, cleft leaf or palate defect, but also involvement with cerebral ocular nasal syndrome. Group cyst, <clears throat> it's interesting because it's not only consisting with hypertellurism, but mainly what with just one structure in, instead of the nose, because this was a complete defect during the birth and of the medial nasal prominence. Abnormal eyes, either cleft or lift, lip or palate um, problem, but also hollow prosencephaly. In reviewing the whole literature, we only can appreciate 56 cases or paper describing this. And as you can see, there are very, very few treatment modalities but also defining where also presented the case, uh, but very, very few correction in regardless of the patients, uh, since the morbidity of those are mainly regardless the first three cases, but not the classification with uh, the cranial deformity. 
the authors mainly presenting the cases, but not describing what were the recommendation and the treatment modalities. Few of them recently were regardless in 83 or the laryngoscope in 77, the trying to do some treatments. Conclusion of this, uh, of this is just uh, this case not only represents uh, a facial deformity, sometimes uh, those cases can be very tricky and need a multidisciplinary approach. And in regard to this, pediatrics, otolaryngologists, plastic surgeon, anesthesiologists, ophthalmologists, radiologists, and psychiatric services are essential for successful managing functional and aesthetic aspect. But sometimes also the cardiovascular nervous system involvement require additional op opinions and respective departments, uh, colleagues' uh, expectation, and also regardless uh, the treatment, the future treatments for these patients. Thank you for the attention. I would remind us, uh, remind you also our uh, ground rounds, which are going to take place tomorrow because we have to uh, take care of Nicholas Rowan, which has some issues during his presentation. If you're interested in smell and taste, I'll suggest you to follow up this. Thank you for the attention. So thank you very much, Puya, for your great presentation and the great case. Um, do you have any questions or are there any questions from the audience? I think at the moment there's nothing in, no questions yet in the chat, but please feel free to write um, any questions um, or do you, each other have questions to Puya? I think it's a very interesting, very complex case. I've never ever seen one of these and uh, management is impossible really, I think. But it's a really nice case, which is uh, nice to present today. I have no questions. I find it's very difficult to, to manage these cases. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we do. Well, I was thinking, oh yeah, so now for now nothing, but then eventually the child will grow probably. I have a question. Uh, how would you approach this um, from an uh, operative standpoint, you know, kind of, uh, how would you start? What's your plan when he's 18, for example, yeah. <laughs> well, when would you start? So, yeah, would you the, the, re the reason why I decided to present this case was actually because I would love to have an interaction with the mm -hmm. audience you as a specialist so what would we what would you do in such cases if the patients would have just one two or three group classification so mainly uh those uh defects and phase defects how would you address those patients do you have any suggestions I would consult a reconstructive nasal surgeon. I'll do the nose, the <laughs> so you need everybody, you need a multidisciplinary, like you mentioned anyway, and you, you need a group of plastics, oculoplastics, and otolaryngology, facial plastics together, and psychology as well, probably as well. Mm -hmm. This child, when they grow, even a childhood psychologist is important, I think when they grow up to a certain age that you can, uh, uh, talk to them and all this about this because it's going to be multiple surgeries over many years. Yes. But nasal breathing was never impaired. Or how, what about what about, was breastfeeding like? Was it possible? Or because I think mainly at the beginning when she, she came to world, was feeding possible? Could she be breastfeeded? Or what was the situation like? Because this would be of my concern to make yeah, sure because no that she's growing. So as, I, <clears throat> so as I said, that the fact that she was uh, crying, uh, the problem, it doesn't require intubation or any other treatment. So the involvement of the nasal uh, component is not a defect. 
So since you have just one nostril and a half working, you're not having some issues regarding the, the, the breathing. The problem comes out when you have a cleft palate involvement. In this, I, I never saw, of course, any of those stages. I just saw some pictures in the internet, but uh, actually it, it just came recently, lately, in the last two, three months. So we, we submitted recently the, the, the case and uh, we will see in the future. When we were referring to our <clears throat> anesthesiologists, of course, they said, we don't have a problem for intubation in such patients. So the, the most difficult part would be the reconstruction of the face. Um, and, and, and so that's why they required you know, a second opinion. They said, we will see in the future because it's, it's a very tough case when you need to reconstruct. And it's very early by now. So instead of treating those patients, we will see in the future if we would have some, uh, you know, psychological assessment before going on operation. Um, Sirkin has some, uh, you know, experience, and I also know that Hashem has some experience with uh, um, reap uh, reconstruction. So. Would you agree to have reconstruction by using ribs in such cases? Uh, yeah. Uh, so can you? Oh, yeah. Okay. So for me, I think this is the least important thing in this age because first of all, the functional things like cleft palate, breathing issues, and also she, uh, the baby has cardiac issues. So first of all, I would wait for reconstruction of the face, but for sure, after all of those things, uh, just uh, handled and then we can move on with reconstruction. I think she uh, has actually a lot of skin access and we can do something to reconstruct this. Maybe not with the rib, but we have a lot of uh, experience with, with different things like even cadaver rib or something, or you can use the rib. But I think it's it's uh, with those cardiac problems it's uh, it's not an issue to I, I wouldn't go with the reconstruction of the face right after yeah i agree, I agree. same and you're gonna have to be at multiple stages because it's still growing anyway yeah sure you can see here no problem here no problem here it's mainly affecting his eyes and here you can see a small, small, very small nostril. So here's the main defect. That's the main problem. Yeah. Okay. So, Puyam, thank you so much you. for presenting this interesting for... case. Thank you, Puyam. Thank you. Um, we would now like to um start with the Austrians. Um, so we have Anna O'Sullivan and Sebastian Rösch from Austria, from Salzburg. They both work at the ENT clinic in Salzburg in Austria. Sebastian is a consultant and he is in his department responsible for the organization of teaching and research. And he always encourages the combination of research and clinical work and he's actively involved not only in Congress organization, but um, is actively taking part. And um, we have Anna, she's working with Sebastian in Salzburg. She's interested in fine needle aspiration, which is why after completing her training in ENT, she's now pursuing a second residency in pathology now. And they will present a case together. And we are really happy to have them. And would like to pass over to Sebastian and Anna. Well, Marlene, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to Olympus for having us and being invited to this um, great group. Um, we are very happy to share a little bit of our experience. So we will bring it back a little bit to an easier case, more usual case. And we would like to stress out um, the, the value of interdisciplinary workup, uh, especially in um, rhinology cases of, of malignancy. And so this is why the title of our talk is gonna be the merit of fine needle aspiration biopsy. So there's no conflict of ours concerning this report. So I'm gonna re present a male patient 
who was aged 46 years in the year of 2016, typical symptoms with the congested nose on the right side for three months. Um, he um, got certain therapy attempts, which didn't help. Um, from his medical history, he had a nicotine abuses of 20 pack years. He had a polytrauma during um, which he had a post-traumatic hydrocephalus with a shunt. Ever since he had um, um, periods of epilepsy and moreover during the polytrauma, he lost, he lost a sight uh, of his left eye, um, which had a serious influence on the upcoming clinical course. Moreover, he had a diffuse goiter and uh, hyperlipidemia. So what we did when he came to our department, usually we did an endoscopy and there was a tumor mass in the right um, um, nose, but there was also some suspicious uh, findings on the left nasal cavity, which of course forced us to do um, um, some imaging. So we did a CT, CT scan and uh, uh, MR. So in the end, this is what we found as expected. We have a suspicious mass uh, of the right side. Um, so therefore we decided for biopsy in general anesthesia, um, which is important. So we always do it in general anesthesia and never without any MRI as you all may know, but which we wanna stress out. And afterwards, seven days later, we got the results from our pathology department. So okay. this is, I'm heading to Anna. Okay. The histologic examination revealed that uh, this tumor was a sinonasal uh, adenocarcinoma of the intestinal type. Um, this kind of tumor is usually very rare. Uh, it's only one to one million without risk factors, but in wood and leather workers, it's 500 times more likely. Our patient was a carpenter. Males are four times more likely than females to suffer from that but it is probably due to occupation. More males are carpenters than females usually. Um, there's an interesting fact that the sinonasal carcinoma of the intestinal type looks in the histology very, very similar to the adenocarcinoma of the colon. I have put the two pictures right there and you can barely see a difference if you only see the histology picture. Usually the age where it occurs is around 60 to 70 and it usually originates from the middle turbinate, the lateral wall, or the ethmoid. The symptoms, like in our patients, are unilateral congested nose or epistaxis. You can have renal ear, you can have pain, double vision, or protrusion of the eye. It always depends on the location or on the um, size of the tumor. If possible, the therapy should be always free margin resection. Uh, because the tumor is not very well radiosensitive. Every tumor that is bigger than a T1 stage should have adjuvant radiotherapy, or if it's close to the, um, yeah, to the eye or to the orbit, you can discuss a proton irradiation. Uh, of course, the best differentiated tumors, the G1, have the best survival rate, with 70% after five years. And with less differentiation of the tumor, the survival rate goes down, of course. Um, when you find in the histology a uh, mucinous or a signet ring appearance, the survival rates are even worse. And even though it's an aggressive tumor, metastasis is rather rare. Usually when firstly diagnosed, only 8% of patients have lymph node metastasis or 13% in other locations. But enough of the statistics, back to the patient. So um, we had a diagnosis in the end after finishing everything with CT4 uh, tumor N0, M0, at least on, on a clinical stage. We uh, had a histology um, differentiation type of G2. So the problem was uh, what we could see, we had an infiltration of the right orbit um, with the left eye being half blind and therefore um, we discussed with the patient uh, and we decided for a lateral rhinotomy uh, and achieve primarily uh, R0 status, um, followed by uh, adjuvant radiochemotherapy uh, with cisplatin. Uh, and luckily, the patient was very happy since he didn't lose his, the sight on the, on the right side. Evermore, we did regular checkups, uh, clinical examination, MRIs, and PET CT scan.
So this is fine for at least two years. In 2018, the patient reappeared with a tearing eye on the right side, reported for two months, uh, and the right eye was protruding. And he also reported on a reduction of mobility, which was um, um, clearly seen, and he said he had double vision. So um, we did another CT scan, and again, uh, we found a recurrency of the tumor, at least a new biopsy was done, which confirmed a recurrency um, of the malignancy. So we started again discussing with the patient, um, asking him what um, we should do, and the patient clearly decided again for surgery. Um, but again, he said his main goal is please keep my only vision or only seeing eye on the right side. Uh, intact and do not remove it under any circumstances. So we again did a lateral rhinotomy. Um, we also had to uh, cover the frontal base uh, with the facial lata. And this time we only achieved the R1 situation. Therefore, uh, in the tumor board, we decided for proton um, uh, eye radiation um, after surgery. So again, um, we had uh, this got on for one year. We had um, a secondary wound healing, which forced us to do also a forehead flap um, in order to um, um, get a better um, wound healing. And again, we did further checkups. So um, June 2021, again, swelling of the right eyelids, no lot of vision. Again, MRI, and again, we had recurrency of the tumor this time on the um, uh, inferior rectal muscle of the eye on the right side. And we started discussing again with the patient and um, same as before, um, patient clearly stated um, that he didn't want to lose his right eye. So we did another surgery with so-called extended resection. Um, we worked together with our maxillofacial colleagues who did a uh, hemimaxillectomy and uh, a free flap with a scapular flap. And again, we only received our one situation. And now it becomes, this is the main part ever since um, we want to stress this out. We did another follow-up PET CT scan uh, in June, 2022. Uh, and we found uh, a suspicious signal in the periobal stays, but also in the thyroid gland, as you can see quite nicely here on, the, um, on this picture. So um, what we did in the end, and this was the interesting thing, since um, due to our organization here, um, fine needle aspiration is quite quickly at hand and with a high competence, um, we decided to do so. And now the interesting case, what we found in the fine needle aspiration will be reported by Anna. Yeah. The thing is, the patient um, for the orbital um, mass, again, he was recommended another operation. Uh, the thing is that with the fine needle aspiration that we could do straight away, we found that there was a metastasis of the cyanonisal carcinoma in the thyroid gland. You can see on the picture of the cytology um, that you can actually see the columna um, build here, in the little, yeah, the columnar build of the cells as you have in the histology. So it was clearly not a thyroid tumor. It was the tumor of the nasal cavity. Well, and therefore, operation is not an option anymore. It's extended disease. Therefore, we went into a palliative care, palliative chemotherapy. The current state of the patient, unfortunately, the disease is progressive. He has lung metastasis metastasis and at the moment he is with kidney failure because of the chemotherapy. Um, a bit of a sad story but um, maybe something to take home. The cyanonasal carcinoma of the intestinal type is very rare but be wary when you have unilaterally symptoms like a congested nose, epistaxis, teary eye or what we've heard before. Um, especially when the patient was a carpenter or leather worker and always tried to achieve free margins. I think that was the main problem the second time we operated. When you have um, this kind of tumor, you can even have 
unusual metastasis because the thyroid usually is not the main goal for metastasis, but it can appear. And fine needle aspiration is a really elegant and feasible um, tool to evaluate neck metastasis, not only in lymph nodes, but also in thyroid glands. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great presentation and very interesting case. Are there any questions? So may I ask a question? Of course. Uh, what do you think about, this is a tricky thing because we do the same thing. Sometimes eye is involved, but patients doesn't want to lose their eyes. And this is so much offensive when you say you can lose your eye. And then what is the rate of induction chemo radiotherapy compared to in, like starting with a, with a surgery? I mean, it's increasing in time because many people are like also not ENTs maybe, but promoting first induction with a chemo. And then if we can spare the eye, if we can save the AI. So what is your experience about that? Mm. I think the study said, especially when it's only a T1, but that is always from definition already that it's not in the orbit, um, then the chemotherapy alone can be okay. But everything after than that, it's it's like it's, it's something where, you know, kind of you need to need... think that just for this case, maybe, you know, sometimes orbit is the orbital wall is diminished and then we get the consent, but this is too offensive. So... I, I just experienced that kind of things mostly because I don't know the invasion rate exactly. The MRI says something, but, you know, before going into a surgery, you don't know, but they offend the surgery. I mean, like the, the patients doesn't want it and they want to go with the uh, induction chemo generally. Nowadays in Turkey, the trend is like that. So we, we don't have the trend on induction chemo, uh, chemotherapy in this case. So we don't have experience with that. I don't know if anyone else has experience would be interesting to hear for induction not in this pathology <clears throat> right. in children with rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma we do but mm -hmm. it's a different yeah. pathology mm -hmm. all right okay. i do have a little other question a very easy one you say you always take biopsies in general anesthesia mm -hmm. also when you have the imaging done why right. not local well, um, first one, we always do biopsy only if we have all the imaging, MRI and CT. Exactly. If it's clear, we may do it also in local. Mm. But uh, what comes to, to, to malignancy of the nose or of the frontal base, we are always more on, 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 on the safe side and try to do it in, in general anesthesia to, to avoid or at least to be prepared for potential complications. So um, for any other malignancy of the head and neck, we do it in, in local, in the chair, but what comes to uh, um, the frontal base, we are always more uh, on the safe side. Even though it's big, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I remember, sorry for interrupting, I remember there are some subtypes <clears throat> We classify when I was with Castor Novo. There are some renal type subtypes of uh, intestinal adenocarcinoma that have a better prognosis compared to the intestinal type one. Even though those are, you know, subtypes, those um, can be treated sometimes along with with surgery. Yeah, they can be. Yeah, especially the um, I think the trabecula or something like that. There, there, there's sometimes some kinds that are with. Um, yeah, you don't need adjuvant therapy afterwards. Yeah, they have a low-grade glandular malignancy. But does it depend on the on the histology appearance or on the grade? Histology and grade, yeah. So. Both my histology appearance, yeah. I've got one question, probably best to Anna um, from from the chat. Who performs the fine needle aspiration under under ultrasound? And how do you prevent too much blood cells in the sample of the thyroid? Um, practice. Um, like it's, um, we have, thankfully, we have one of the most experienced um, fine needle aspiration probes 
and our team um, who does it for over 40 years. And uh, it's a case of practice. I've been doing this now for three years and I can remember like my first samples were like uh, a blood bath. And now I can actually get cells without the blood. It's, it's like, it's, it's mainly just a thing of practice. You, you go in, you aspirate, you, um, and as soon as you see the blood, you stop. But what you need is only like 20 microliters or something. You don't need much. And therefore you mostly have the tumor cells. You do it under vision, under the, with the ultrasound. And then you, um, usually you don't get the blood. No, it's, 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 it's yeah. yeah, you can. Well, uh, what I want to emphasize is that uh, it is important to see that taking a fine needle biopsy is not the work of a clinician and not the work of a pathologist. There's a speciality called clinical cytology, where we are trained in meeting patients using you ultrasound, taking a correct biopsy and looking at the smear, both in routine stain and all special stains. That means we decide bedside what special stains we do immediately, because often we use uh, cytochemical um, uh, information to subtype a tumor, but often we use also uh, genetic analysis, molecular analysis to, uh, to give uh, therapeutic um, information. So uh, what Anna and uh, we are doing together in Salzburg and in Stockholm is that we are specialized as clinician and cytologist and work as clinical, clinical cytologist. That is important. I think it's important also that the one person who takes the probe looks at it because then you have, you know, exactly what you took and uh, where you were in the lesion and um, you have the reassurance that you were in the tumor and there are the right cells and you know how much blood was in there actually. You know, kind of it's, it's if you get a sample from someone else, you never know, was it the right one? Was it not? It's, it's take the sample yourself. And that is like a really, um, yeah. A nice specialty to do, you know, I love it. We um, also do it um, at the University Hospital of Basel. We we do it and we have like an amazing team with the nurses and work together really well. And then we usually take like three samples just to make sure that we get, the, get enough cells. <laughs> and it usually works. So thank you very much for your case. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining from Austria. We would now like to go on with Professor Serkan Gode. Professor Serkan Gode is an Izmir based surgeon and professor in the ENT department at Ege University School of Medicine. He is very well known for his rhinoplasty combined and combined facial and endonasal surgery. And he especially uses the close technique in rhinoplasties and also in revision um, cases. He has published widely and probably among us has the most, most followers on Instagram. <laughs> Maybe, so, or maybe not. I don't know exactly, but actually, yeah, Instagram is important also you know, for introduction right now. Thank you so much, Sakan. Thank you. Thanks for in invitation and also thanks for kind introduction. And I'm happy to be here. Merry Christmas to everyone and happy new year to everyone. Okay, my case is, uh, so I have to just... Uh, mute my computer because there is uh, you know voice in my video so I'm gonna mute it so if you want to say something please Marlon just mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just remind me and then I'm gonna open the voice okay now uh, I'm doing my share so sorry okay can you see right now all right, so I wanna in I wanna just uh, present here a reconstructed rhinoplasty case. Actually, a rhinoplasty case which turned out into being a reconstructed case, and uh, which is that we never want a necrosis that happened to that patient. Literally, this patient uh, has been operated in the private hospital that I operate also by another surgeon. And during the ERS meeting in Thessaloniki, when I was there, 
with Puya and, and Marlene, maybe Hesham was there also. So this lady was operated very unluckily. And then for six days, she couldn't see her nose. When I got back from Thessaloniki to the, to the work again, they said to me that as a consultant, you have to see a case. Six days, she never saw her nose. And after six days, uh, she saw and look at the insane look of her. It's very interesting, but it's very also annoying to me at least. And she, six days later, saw her nose like that. And it was a rhinoplasty, okay. Six, uh, 56 years old lady. And then they consulted me and everything started. She was shouting at me, everyone, you know, you cannot help her. And then for sure, we started hyperbaric oxygen. For that day, it was a, a mess, you know. She didn't see her nose and, and also the doctor came to the room and did some extra interventions, which are not consented. So what turned out into a, for sure, judicial case, and now it's going on. And also those unconsented, small, they say, interventions, but they are right now like a torture. You know, it's it's the big case right now, it's still going on. And then we, as a medical thing, hyperbaric oxygen, IV antibiotics, local therapies, and MRI, CD scan, we documented everything, necessary consultations with plastic surgeons, ENTs from universities, psychiatrists, and decent attorney, I found her, and no steel retainers, unlimited online consultations. Why I say unlimited online consultations? Because six months later, she came back to the same hospital where she botched and then got a surgery with me. And that was a hard case, actually. That was tricky because of hundreds of consultations. And then she was only trusting me and some of the guys. And then she came back. When she came back, this was the case. No breathing at all, almost none. And the nose was collapsed, no nauseous. And... That was a bad necrosis case with some loss of cartilages, also mucosa around. So for sure, we had to do a... This was just on the operative day. So rhinoplasty came out to be a reconstructive case for us. And then when we opened the nose, uh, it was, you know, there was proline stitches inside, no, more, more stitches on the, on the days of more interventions than the early post-op. And then we opened the nose, there was defect. The septum was intact on the posterior, but on the caudal side, there was no septum and no mucosa at the same time. So we had to bring mucosa and I did the uh, reverse nasoceptal flap uh, for this case for one side. I'm gonna show every detail. And then this is, uh, this was the rib because she has a little bit, uh, you know, elderly she was, so it was somehow calcified. And then we brought the rib, we reconstructed everything. Um, and then look at, and we brought mucosa from from uh, uh, like greater palatine artery based mucosa. And then one side mucosa has brought the blood and the other side, I used a composite graft to reconstruct the uh, columel. One side rib and mucosa and the other side composite graft. And this is the composite, Simba Concha, where I get the composite on left side. I used composite, right side, ribbon, uh, mucosal flap. And for sure, st still, we have a skin defect. It is the paramedian flap, forehead flap. And I did the forehead flap. It's, it was an extended one. For sure, we need to build the columella. In those kind of cases, I use generally that kind of of uh, uh, columnar uh, reconstruction, but I leave the uh, maybe we can use if we fail around this columnar because it's the most risky part for those 
like uh, island flaps or or like local flaps, like because she has a long philtrum, you can use both local flaps uh, to reconstruct the columella back again. This is the three days post-op. Yeah, that was hard days and we use nostril retainers. And then the lady came to me uh, like after my surgery, four months after. And then this was the case. Yeah, actually it's not completely perfect, but it's much more better. She's breathing right now. Now it's time to do some, uh, you know, laser work for, for those um, hair follicles around the tip. Um, maybe one year later, we may have small uh, touch-ups to the edges that the forehead flap uh, like converges with the original ALR skin, which is retracted. Uh, but she's uh, she has at least a nose right now, and she's happy. So uh, the necrosis case now it's just the judicial thing is go going on. Otherwise, um, she's better uh, when this happened to her. And so if I have time, I want to show an in infection case if you have time. Uh, do I have a time, Marlene? Yes. Okay. Now this was a three times operated, one time rip case, which is caused by an infection. And then it turned on into, again, a very bad nostril retractions. I do my uh, revisions in closed approach. You, some of you know, Pia and Marlene knows. Um, so I didn't want to open this nose. I did the dissection in closed approach and I could achieve a dissection plane. I first use hydro dissection plane to be able to create a space and then I go inside and do this dissection. It's good for contracted and retracted skin types. And then I use a lot of composite grafts. The composite grafts should be touching the skin, otherwise it doesn't work. I mean, cartilage to cartilage never works, but this part should touch the skin to get blood supply. And this is this is how I reconstruct in closed approach. Uh, there are composites on the sides, and also there is composite to, to make the nose a little longer and more projected. This is where we started. This is where we ended up. This is where we started. This is where we ended up. Yeah, she has an nostril. She has at least a nostril right now. She can breathe much more better. And the skin is safe. It's good. I didn't give this case uh, uh, hyperbaric oxygen or chamber therapy, but uh, she's much more better than before right now in closed approach can be good in that kind of skin issue patients. And if, if we are concerning about the skin viability. Thank you very much. My presentation is that much. Thank you so much, Serkan, for the great presentation and the cases. Um, are there any questions? Serkan, the first case was she a uh, secondary rhinoplasty, posse, but because she got severe infection, was it? Uh... Actually, actually, it was. Let me tell the truth. Uh, it was a. Uh, primary rhinoplasty, secondary because of septum work, because septoplasty she had before. The yeah. biggest problem is the doctor did every day on-site interventions, which is now a problem in judicial oh, thing because they were unconsented. Now the patient says that she tortured me during those interventions. And so it's, it's an infection or it's a chop off nose or it's a we don't know actually what happened there. So, you know, we don't know. It's a it's a big problem and it's a it's a very sad story actually for her. Very nice reconstruction though. Ah, thank you very much. I mean, just it's a regular thing for for at flap. Uh, Fantastic work. Uh, I I um uh, have you ever used Doppler for the reconstruction to, Use, to get uh, Hesham knows we are working with Mr. Apaiden, Fazil Apaiden, and he used this for years. Uh, but actually, it's places you know, somehow it's okay to find it. And so, if you have to make you know, make lengthen it too much, Puya, 
then mm -hmm. sure, but I rather go high up to the hairline, uh, mm -hmm. not to stay, you know, and I use oblique to make a better length, you know, to, to be able to use a better length, oblique to the other side. Okay. okay. Be sure to check for diabetes also in these cases. Huh? Yeah, sure. Uh, she has actually a diabetes, but it was controlled diabetes, actually. Okay. Now, some doctors I know, they don't, do, you know, you can select patients for everything, but diabetes is a big problem, actually, for skin issue patients. So um, that was a good question, by the way. I mean, like some doctors doesn't do in Turkey uh, diabetes cases and yeah. small cases and smoking cases at the same time. Maybe it's the, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> but this was a very bad surgery, by the way. You know, it's it's... It's completely different. Thank you very much, Serkan. We would now like to move on, and our next speaker will be Guidje Adriensen. He works at the Amsterdam Medical Center in Amsterdam uh, in the Netherlands and specializes in rhinology and rhinoplasty. He was trained in the Netherlands, but also did a rotation in Boston and also in an observational fellowship in Italy in Varese. His faculty in numerous courses on rhinology and rhinoplasty in the Netherlands and also in Europe. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, Marlene, for this kind introduction. I'm having so much fun already in preparing. We got some Christmas chocolates and a whole layout of beverages. So things become serious. I have serious coffee. If it becomes a little more festive, and as a tribute for uh, Puya, some sparkling uh, lemonade. And then once we finish our, <laughs> our proper case seminars here, maybe some good old, you know, apple juice. <laughs> so, but then I also have one video that I always wanted to share actually. And I think this might be the perfect opportunity to do so, even though it's not really rhinological, but as a rhinologist, of course, you also have general on calls. So very quickly, a story about this 18-year-old boy who said he uh, was apping at his phone, which is very dangerous, of course, and then he hit his bathroom door and he came into the ER with the swelling and pain on the left side of his mandible, no throat ache, swallowing pain, and a, and a trismus, a, a locked jaws, I think you call it. And he was taken care of by the maxillofacial surgeons. And they saw a mediumly ill uh, person with a swelling around the mandible. Level three was painful. And they also saw an asymmetrical swelling in the pharyngeal arch on the left side. And he was a little bit infectious. And this was actually the CT scan. And this was in March. So at least you see some kind of an infiltration with, with gas formation. It's pretty extensive. goes all the way down into the neck. And they admitted him, of course, for intravenous antibiotics. And then the next day, he actually had a wedding of his sister. So he refused to stay and he left. And on oral antibiotics, they, they kept on consulting him at the outpatient clinic. It went well, it went less well, it went well, it went less well. And then finally in May or beginning of June, three months later, they made an MRI and sent him to us uh, because this is the MRI. And then maybe you see this, but what is that? Did you see that? <laughs> I've always wanted to show this video. <laughs> what is that? You see? So this is what that is. And here it comes, the video, the, the, the Christmas fireside video, which I really want to show. Let's see, how do I get to the next one? There we go, I need to lose this for a second. Press play. Do you see it? <laughs> Out comes this, and I don't know what that is, but it looks to me as if it's the, you know, something on the, on the, on the, like a thing on the leg of a chair where you put the chair, you know? So, uh, well, I've always wondered, we talked to the patient and he said he had no idea how they got in there and nothing strange happened, but I can only imagine how you get that jammed in the back of your throat. So that was basically just very quickly. <laughs> My, my little Christmas video, and then on to a little light rhinology with, I think, a nice 
thing in the end to take home. Six, six year old lady with a headache. Um, she had a headache before and she had an external approach to the frontal sinus before because of a mucosal or at least some polyps unilateral in there. And what they did is a medial eyebrow incision and they put a little trephine in there and they endoscopically cleared the frontal sinus, removed some polyps and maybe a cyst, left the drain even, put some steroid antibiotic cream, left it there, maybe poked into the frontal recess and the pathology came back with chronically inflamed respiratory mucosa. And that was okay for her for approximately three years. Uh, but then all her complaints uh, came back, basically. Trying to remove this. So three years, no complaints. And back she came in and then she was sent to us because she had, again, pressure around her left eyebrow. She had a headache. Sometimes maybe her eyelid got swollen, no rhinorrhea or congestion, rinsing was unproductive. Um, and this is double, I'm sorry about that, but this is the surgery that was done. And we did some imaging. And this is the first one I wanted to show you. It's a CT scan. Well, obviously that left frontal sinus is still blocked. And there has not been made a very nice connection to the frontal recess on that side. But if you look very well, you see the bony defect from the trephination, but you also see something of a mucosal. But then if you look further into the frontal sinus on the left, you see, yeah, different densities of gray in there and some osteotic reaction. So basically we can understand why her complaints uh, came back. And we also made an MRI just to be sure that it was not something else on the left side there, the frontal sinus. And it shows this, probably a mucosal, but then something else on the left side there. You see, there's all these densities. It doesn't really look like an inverted papilloma or anything. It's not a columnar striated pattern or, but what is it? Well, anyway, in order to treat her, uh, we decided to perform a draft three procedure. And a little thing here already in the CT is that you can see that she has a very deep radix and a very narrow radix. So even though it looks like an easy, straightforward draft three, if the radix is very deep, I'm always a little bit on edge already because things feel like they're higher when you're doing the draft three. And this is, for example, starting to do the draft three. But uh, even if we make this horseshoe a little bit open already, and this is the, the frontal recess here, coming towards the back wall of the frontal sinus, still we haven't reached anything. So this is the first video. And this is where I hit the mucosal. Woohoo, it's always a nice moment. It opens up and you're a little worried maybe, but it's, it's clearly not CSF and it's open. So that's nice. So then you start cleaning this. It's not really a mucosal, it's a mucopiocele, I think, because of all the debris that came out. But this was medial and we still have to go lateral. We keep on drilling as we do. We nicely open all, all uh, the septations and the cavities. And then also this stuff comes out. You already see it here a little bit. Do you see it? It's right there. And uh, of course, we take it out and put it through pathology. And maybe you think, ah, ah, that's typical. I know this, it's a fungus. Well, maybe it is, maybe not. So you start continuing to make it into a nice draft three. You have to go all right around the corner. So you better be sure to uh, drill all the way up to the skin, which is perfectly fine, actually. Just don't go through the skin, but then at least you see that you're all the way at the maximum diameter that you can reach. So you can clean off a little further and uh, rinse and rinse and take it all out until everything is nicely opened and you stay with a nice draft three cavity, as we can see here. Put the tampons in, let it heal. We like to keep on these fatty gauzes uh, in there up until three weeks actually, and then uh, only then we take them out. We think uh, the osteum stays much nicely uh, patterned that way. 
But then what did the pathology say about what was in there? Well, actually, this was a case of myospherulosis. And this is something that you might, uh, well, you actually, if you know this, you get triggered by it and you see it more often. It's not really seldom. And it's some kind of tumor-like process caused by the interaction of damaged erythrocytes and some form of lipids. In this case, probably the ointment, and especially also in orbital surgery. The orbital surgeons always say if the, if the orbital fat is in the nose, be careful with ointment because you can get myocerulosis. And in this case, the exogenous lipids, for example, from post-operative packing, actually can cause this type of infection, which degrades bone a little bit, looks a little bit like a fungus. So the take home message of this case is, of course, sometimes we like to put cream there, and maybe a lot, to prevent infection or stenosing of the ostia. And that's okay. Just put it in a place where you know you're able to rinse it out. And if it closes off, just be careful with filling a sinus with ointment. That's uh, basically the, the light take home message I would like to say. And with that, um, a short and straightforward case, I think. Thank you very much for your case. Really interesting. Oh, and of course, on behalf of our whole Amsterdam Rhinology team, I forget, I want to wish you all a very happy Christmas and a happy new year. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great talk. Do you have any questions? I don't. <laughs> well, it's very interesting. I've seen this in the maxillary sinus. Yes. Yeah. I think it's probably commoner there, but I, I've already seen a couple of cases, but it's so rare. It's actually really? quite, uh, if it is anywhere, it's mostly in the, in the, in the sinuses. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Would it be mostly in the maxillary sinus? Yeah. yeah. Probably more, but also ointment related yeah. and packing related. Yeah. So another argument against packing. Exactly. No. At least be careful what you do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if there are no more questions, we'll move on to our last, last case, our last presentation. And we would like to finish with Professor Hesham Saleh from London. He's a London-based consultant, rhinologist, and facial plastic surgeon, and he's working at Charing Cross Hospital and at the Harley ENT practice, and he holds a professorship at the Imperial College in London. He specializes also mainly in rhinology, and they're mainly rhino rhinoplasty and endoscopic sinus surgery. He's been the past president of the rhinology section of the Royal Society of Medicine. And his research is also focusing around rhinitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, and nasal deformities. Also, apart from that, I'd also like to mention, he's the chairman of the editorial board and active member of the ENT masterclass, which is another concept to provide free high quality training in our subject. So we're looking forward very much to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlene, and uh, for arranging this really nice uh, webinar, uh, you and Pavel. And uh, thanks for everybody who presented very nice cases too. I'm really enjoying this. So I'm going to tell you about how a patient mysteriously lost the nose. So we'll see. So I have no conflict of interest. So this patient was referred to me a couple of years ago. She's 42 years old lady. She had recurrent epistaxis, but not the main thing. The main thing is was progressive nasal deformity. She is known to have schizophrenia, which is a very important part of this presentation. This is her. The patient presented like this. You can see from the frontal view that it's almost like a rhinectomy and these oblique views and the lateral views. What's the history? What happened? There's nothing. We don't know why uh, this happened. So we started looking into this, taking a good history, and we're having an examination. So there's loss of skin, as you can see, uh, all the cartilage framework of the of dorsum. The bone is still there, so the bony dorsum is here, but everything is scarred. There's no septum. 
intranasally, there's crusting, but nothing else. So what's this? We take the history again and realize that a few years earlier, she was seen by Professor Claire Hopkins. And she gave me this picture, Professor Claire Hopkins. And you could see her nose was a bit better, but was already uh, losing the lower third, a bit of septum here. She was fully investigated there under the Professor Claire Hopkins. Nothing was found. And then she disappeared and she was referred to us a few years later. So what's going on? So we did full investigations. Everything you can imagine to look for granulomatous disease, GPA, uh, sarcoidosis, everything. Full blood count, UNE, NCA, ACE, ESR, CRP, all normal. So there's no inflammatory uh, process that's going on. Then the CT and MRI, apart from the loss of skin and cartilage and bone, there's everything is normal. It doesn't look like it's acute inflammatory process at all. So I took a biopsy and it says non-specific chronic inflammation. So what's next? What would you do? What else? We decided we're going to check, is there any self-harm? So because she is obviously she's got a schizophrenia. I've never seen patients who actually damage the nose, just focus on the nose. So did a 24 hours camera surveillance un under the supervision of a psychiatrist and there was no evidence of self-harm. So what do we do next? It's very short. What do we manage? How do we manage this patient? Shall I ask you or shall I just keep going? <laughs> I'll keep going. So we don't know what the cause was. Discussed it with a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist said there's no evidence of self-harm, although it's very, very rarely reported uh, in patients with schizophrenia. And there's another syndrome I'll explain to you in a minute. But there's no evidence. So did the patient scratch her nose out? Kept scratching like this until it came off? Maybe, but we have no evidence. I looked in the literature. There was one case report of self-mutilation of the nose in a schizophrenic patient with a Cotard syndrome. What's Cotard syndrome? Uh, they call it a nihilistic delusion. So the patient do not think they're alive. So they have the belief that they not belong. They don't belong to this world. So that patient, in this case report, decided to remove her nose. But that patient admitted that she removed her nose. Our patient said, "I don't know. It just happened." So it does, she doesn't know how it happened. And as I said to you, surveillance that we did and previously in Guy's hospital did not show anything. So after discussions, I referred to dermatology. I wrote a letter and referred it to um, our oral surgery department because they do the prosthetics. Uh, they didn't find anything and we decided to provide her with a prosthetic nose because we obviously don't know what's going on. And that well, the other thing is just give her a prosthetic nose to wear and to see what happens. This is the last follow-up letter from uh, the technician who is really amazing. She does amazing looking noses. They said it's just not working. Through the appointments, there was a lot of several changes in the tissue. The nose is still changing a lot. So she could never fit the prosthesis properly. And she's still seeing the patient, but it's nothing that happened that is really ideal. So she's, she's changing the prosthesis again and again and again. And up till now, it's a mystery. We don't know what causes this, but we do, all of us believe that it's probably a self harm. But the family are completely against this. I do not want to believe that. The whole family believe that this is some pathology that caused this. So that is my case. Thank you very much and Merry Christmas. Thank you for, very much for the great case and for the mystery. <laughs> Does anyone have any ideas or questions regarding that special case? How often did you biopsy? Just I, once? Uh, I biopsied twice uh, and she was biopsied uh, by Claire. Uh, at least once in a few years before. Yeah. And our biopsy multiple areas all around the skin, externally and also internally, many, many biopsies. Hmm. So we're still waiting to see what happens next, but she's yeah. still coming back to follow up for the prosthetics and for us. Any sure. idea? Obviously, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use Serkan, I wouldn't put a forehead flap because you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it wouldn't work in this case for sure. <laughs> it's, you know, very interesting. Yeah.
midline granulomas can be really difficult to catch, but doesn't look like it. So obviously the other thing that uh, I see a lot in London nowadays is patients using cocaine and we see yeah, severe but damage, but I have not seen complete skin loss like this. So we see skin scarring, uh, shriveling, retraction. And you would have an increased anchor. You would have a vasculitis kind of. Positive, yeah. yeah, you can always increase anchor, almost always. And she's not the type of patient that would be using that anyway. So, no. so it is not that. No. We have a question from the chat um, from a colleague. He is asking whether it's Munchausen syndrome. Uh, you mean that somebody else in the family is doing it? Yeah. So we spoke. The uh, psychiatrist said no, no chance. Yeah. So Munchausen syndrome. I've seen this. That somebody else damages or causes harm on a on another member of the family or so on because they're presenting something psychological in themselves. So uh, psychiatrist said no. Yeah, it's a good question. And has, she, has the patient ever been like under, not only under like 12 or 24 hours surveillance, but under a longer? Yeah, twice under us, 24 hours. Camera, when, mm -hmm. day when she's sleeping as well, and under Guy's hostel. Uh, maybe Pavel's seen her before as well. It's possible, you know, because it was a few years ago. <laughs> so they did it as well. <laughs> But no longer than like two day, like 24 hours. 24 hours. Yeah, that was the longest. Long. Did she always knew around. about the camera? Did so, she know about the camera? Yeah, she knew about the camera. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you should monitor her on over a longer period of time. Yeah. So this is the psychiatrist doesn't want to do that. And mm -hmm. there's an issue of consent. You can't do it without her knowing as well. So that's which is all, which is also good. I mean yeah yeah anyway all of us believe it is self-harm but we can't prove it so that, yeah. that, that's that's answer but it's very unusual because looking at all the literature just one case report like this i've got another question from the chat i think you you already said like um that all parameters for vasculitis were checked um a colleague is asking whether it might be or there has been any vascular consultation or peripheral vascular insufficiency uh no well interesting something that i haven't mentioned here she's been seen by dermatology a lot and they examine her because the physicians and they found some evidence of cuts in her shin and her legs every now and then which they think is from her nails as well they, they found some evidence of like skin and her nails so they found something like this mm -hmm. Uh, but that was the only thing, this only other thing that they all ever found. But not vascular disease, peripheral vascular disease. Did you ever ask uh, people from the forensic department whether mm. they have ideas to, to, to find every, any evidence of harm or something like that? That's an interesting, uh, yeah, maybe we could. What happens because, I mean, Forensics are the ones you usually think about finding stuff under the nails or something. I think if the family agrees, we have to, yeah, we, that is a possibility. They're probably yeah, somebody like a policing really kind of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're right. Because uh, we have to go through psychiatry and the family to do that. So that's an next step. Of, that's, a, that's a good suggestion, definitely. Yeah. So. Thank you all so much for the amazing session for the first Christmas special. Um, thank you very much to all presenters from all over. Very happy to have you all here. And thank you also to Pablo Surda and the ERS and of course Olympus as our sponsor. Thank you so much for the great session and we wish you all a great Christmas and holiday season and Looking forward to seeing you hopefully soon in the next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye bye. bye. <laughs>